Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hey, welcome back. We're live in San Francisco, California, VMworld 2012. This is theCUBE. We go out to the events, instruct the students from the noise. I'm John Furrier, and my co-host for this segment is Stu Miniman, analyst at wikibon.org, and we're pleased to have star-studded guest, Martin Casado. always brings the energy. Day three, we need to get that injection. Um, formerly of Nasira, which was purchased by VMware, and that huge deal everyone talked about, it feels like 20 years ago, two years ago. Uh, welcome back to theCUBE, Martin, great to see you. Hey, it's awesome to be here, thanks Looking for having me. Looking good, doing a selfie in theCUBE with Stu, that's nice, <laughs> we'll post that later. Um, so I got to ask you, we were just talking prior to come in, this is, uh, are we, again, another year of SDN? I mean, finally, uh, ne well, next year's going to be the year of SDN, is it going to be this year, next year? This happened in the local area network days back in you know right. in the 90s, right. the year of the land. Next year, yeah, yeah, yeah. what's the story? Is it here or not? What's the deal? Yeah, no, 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 that's a good question. So, like, I mean, I think like if I have one high-level point uh, for this VM world, which is the last seven years, it's like you know, it's coming in the future. It's almost like I feel like I've been like leading people, like going over like the mountains. I'm like, I swear, over that next mountain, that is the time for network virtualization. I mean, that, that's the time for network virtualization. I promise, I promise. I promise it's there. Like I know, like you're tired and you're hungry and you haven't eaten and you're cold. So the dam broke six months ago and we're arrived. So like now, this is the first VMware. I'm like, we've arrived. I mean, and you just like look at the commercials, right? I mean, we're at hundred million dollar run rate. We've got wins in every vertical. We've got over 150 paying customers. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a big deal. Now this is a real business and a real momentum. And so we shift from like this kind of evangelical notion to like, okay, people are using it. Why are they using it? How do you enable sales forces? What does this mean to the channel? I mean, this actually now becomes more of a business right, so issue. Let's, let's go back and let's rewind. The dam broke six months ago. Just yeah. describe the, that moment. Where were you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. What's happening? <laughs> so and what specifically <laughs> broke? And where, you know, what right. happened? I mean, yeah, what yeah. specifically? Right. Take us through that. Those, those well, first couple steps. Right. So maybe I'll provide just a little bit of history, which is okay. So Nasira was founded in 2007. So you know, I actually kind of left my defense and I went and I, uh, I, uh, I founded Nasira with with Scott and Nick. Um, the first version of MVP came out in about 2010, um, but it didn't have support for vSphere. Right. So then in 2012, we got it acquired by VMware, and about nine months ago did we have a, a, a supported version of NSX that supported vSphere that kind of had a lot of the bells and whistles. Since then, since then, <clears throat> we've grown the customer base to you know, over 150 paying customers and a $100 million run rate business. And this is in nine months. And by the way, like the core sales team, um, we just added NSX to the price list for the core sales team in June 6th, so that just started. So what we're seeing is we have a viable product to market, we've got a sales team that can sell it, we've got massive customer adoptions in many verticals, and this has all happened in the last nine months. So it's just a tremendous amount of momentum. So I got to ask you, I know Stu's chopping at the bit, but I want to ask you, EMC <laughs> had the same issue with Extreme IO. A lot of hype with Flash, and just on directed availability, they just, you know, the dump truck of dropping all the, all the product to their existing install base. How much was that VMware starving customers versus product market fit, in your opinion? Yeah, no, no, that's actually a great question. So I actually think that we're actually sales limited, right? This is, this is software. Um, we have a direct sales force. These are direct deals. A lot of these are in production. Actually, I was talking with Andrew Lerner recently from Gartner, and he talked to 15 of our customer references. 10 of them were in production, so this is a good statistical sampling of them in production. And so I think that there's a real need, there's a real product market fit, and now we just need to find the right use cases that can be carried by a sales team into the, into the customer base. Yeah, so Martin, you yeah. know, one of the proof points for me is the FUD in the marketplace is deafening. <laughs> uh, everybody out there has said that, you know, the, the architecture, it, it doesn't scale. Yeah. Um, we, we you know, if we, we look at how this was built, you know, everything that you've done with NSX and yeah. that nice year before, I mean, scale is, you know, mentioned in every sentence. So, yeah. can you kind of address that? Why, why is that being said out there and, and what's the reality? Yeah, I mean, it's so difficult for me to like talk to every piece of FUD because like there's so, there's so much of it. Like I, I heard actually recently that Nasir was started in 2004, which is not true because being the one that started it, it was in 2007. I heard that MVP has been around for seven years, which is not true. I, I actually contributed a lot of the early code, so I wrote the code, and it hasn't been out that long. And so, I mean, there's just you so. Wrote the code. I, I, I was going to say, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, right. So there's there, there's just been so many threads and so many narratives with by so many per people. And when it comes to things like scale and performance, I mean, I mean, let, let's look back. I mean, some of our early customers. By the way, we've never lost an early customer. 
Some of our early customers were development partnerships. That means like, actually, in one customer, I personally remember being there and writing code like to fix stuff while things were happening. So you, know, you have early product in market with customers and you always have issues, whether it's scale or performance or stability or whatever. This happens in early code development. Um, and so I think what's happening is I think that people will cherry pick these examples and say it's an architectural issue, right? Which is, which is like a real classic conflation between say like implementation and architecture. Like products have issues, especially early products, but like architecturally, the scaling is fine. Certainly performance is fine. And, and it, what's nice about this is actually going up the sales ramp, we've got lots of customers using this stuff um, and, and things are looking great. And so the good news is we don't have to pick historical examples anymore. We don't have to be archeologists. We can look at how people are using it today. Okay, so last year when NSX was launched, uh, partners were tripping over themselves to say how yeah. they work really closely right. uh, with you. Can, can you give us a little bit of insight from an engineering standpoint? I mean, you, you now have the whole, networking is your whole baby. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what's going on with the partnerships and, and how, how are you working together with the ecosystem? Right, so just to be clear, I mean, they, there, are, there are sales alliances like resellers and, and bars, and then there's technical partners. Which yep. one do you want me to address? Uh, technical partners. Oh yeah, so technical partners. So, um, uh, you know, NSX is a platform, right? And in fact, we've reaffirmed that with our recent announcements around the Goldilocks Zone, which is, which is a security platform. And so, we're at a point now that we're largely market-led, which is we look at the customers and what they want and which partners they want us to work with, and that's where we spend engineering resources. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, partnering requires not just engineering resources, but it requires us to do validation and design and so forth. And so we've engaged with a number of partners. We've made a number of large announcements recently on the switch funders. I mean, good announcements with Arista, with Cumulus, with HP. On the, we've done a number of announcements with Palo Alto Networks, joint customers with all of these guys, same thing. And so, you know, we engage them as quickly as we can. Um, we do what's best to prioritize resources based on customer demand, and we're very excited about the partner ecosystem we've developed. Yeah, so even when I hear people talk about the Federation, sometimes people get a little confused. I've yeah. heard people say, EMC is going to buy uh, a networking switch company, or <laughs> you know, VMware is going to get into the, the business. The whole Project Marvin thing on converged infrastructure, yeah. everybody was completely convinced that VMware was going to go into the hardware business. Yeah. I mean, VMware, in its place, is software, right? We're software, we're a software company, this is a software play. I mean, I think what's happening is, you know, and not just from network virtualization. I mean, you're lifting functionality out of the network and you're re-implementing it in software whether that software is a generation three application or it's a network overlay. And so that allows um, people to view the physical network as, as, as basically transport. And this is kind of creating somewhat of a food fight on the physical networking layer. Like, where in the value chain are our customers comfortable with? Do they want to do Dell? Do they want to do Dell and Cumulus? Do they want to do Arista? Do they want to do Cisco? And so it's nice to see it open up and allow the market to decide. I think it's way too early for us to choose a winner. All right, so Martin, first yeah. time we had you on theCUBE, you were banging on the table talking about how open source was going to be critical. Yeah. I heard a lot of open source announcements here at the show. So, yeah, yeah OCP, yep. OpenStack, yeah. uh, and you know, where does kind of, uh, you know, I guess start with OpenStack and open source, sure. you know, fit into the discussion uh, for, for your group today? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I feel like I'm just, I'm like progressively moving up layers in, uh, in, in open source. So, um, you know, we started uh, with Open vSwitch, which is a data path layer technology, right? Like, that has been a resounding success, and it's in so many clouds, it's adopted by so many companies, both competitors and non-competitors alike. I still have a large team working on it, um, it's still, you know, open source and available in Linux. So I, I, I got a question from the community on that. Your, the, the VMware version of the Open vSwitch, will that interoperate with other controllers? Yeah, well, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, Open vSwitch is Open vSwitch. It's an open source product that, I mean, there's, well, you know. You guys have kind of your own flavor, though, that ships with NSX. We do not have our own flavor. Okay, it, it's 100% it's the same. We have Open vSwitch, we have standard Open vSwitch. Okay. And open vSwitch is Open vSwitch, right? And so, and so that, I mean, is Open vSwitch. So then you go up there. So then I say, okay, so the southbound interface, OVSDB, OpenFlow, Open vSwitch, something that you know, my teams have worked on. Then you've got the controller layer. So you want a northbound interface to that, which is like Neutron and Quantum. I've got two core developers on it. This is a project we've been involved in, in, in both cultivating and, or incubating early on and developing. And then now I'm going even a layer above that, which is policy. So once, once that configuration and management gets, um, worked out, you go to the policy layer, and this is the Congress project that I started, right? So also an open source development effort, a team that I, I lead that's doing that. So I mean, I just feel like I'm touching many parts of the stack, I'm just slowly working my way up. Okay, we, asked, we asked Pat that same question, so I got to come back to you and, yeah. and bring up a, a different perspective. I know Stu wanted want to go in the weeds there, um, but I want to take it up a, lot, a, a level sure. for the developers. Obviously, the apps are driving and dictating terms to the infrastructure. The apps are hungry 
to program the infrastructure, yeah. right? So I got to get your take on this. Okay. Open source, obviously, we all love it. And yeah. Docker is showing a little bit of a twist on how they're implementing it, which yeah. is beautiful yeah. and gets really helps developers. So that's the container. Okay, that's nice, great. Infrastructure as yeah. code. The vision has always been get the infrastructure in a position where policy, configuration management, provisioning, all the automation is can be programmed by apps. Where are we and how okay. are we, the work that you're doing right accelerates that dream and that position for the app developers. Okay, so I'm going to take a totally contrarian view here. So here's my contrarian view. I don't think applications app developers want to even think about infrastructure. I don't think there'll ever be an API to the infrastructure. I don't think applications will ever talk to the infrastructure. So I come back from the days that of like- contrarian? That's what applications, they hate code, they hate the network, don't they? No, no, but I, do, I, think, I don't think they'll ever program it or they're ever going to want to control it, ever. So like I come from the days of like working in like supercomputers of different architectures. And if I look at the evolution of programming models for the application, before we used to know everything. We used to know cache layouts. We used to know um, the caching hierarchy, yeah, yeah, page yeah. sizes. We know where memory was, what was local, what was remote. We would know different, you know, and if you look at the actual programming model, it's gone far enough away that now you don't care about these things anymore, and you just treat, treat compute like compute, and network like network, and you don't talk to it. I actually think, like, the history of the computer science industry is people trying to provide APIs to the infrastructure and application writers not using it. I mean, this has happened many times in networking. So I think what's going to happen is application writers are going to forget about the infrastructure. The infrastructure should be virtualized with a software layer, totally virtualized as a software layer, and they'll be totally decoupled. So as, a control as a plane, like a control plane for the app. So the app itself has to do its own intelligence. Exactly, the app does, doesn't care about the infrastructure. It won't talk to the infrastructure, it won't program the infrastructure. The app is the app. It'll, it'll be concerned with its data and its computation, and a, a, an intelligent software layer will manage everything for the infrastructure. Great, let's take that next step. So what's going on in the plumbing <laughs> to yeah. make that happen? So wh what do you see in sequence to pull this off? Yeah, so I think that the most disruptive thing that's happening over the last 10 years is we're seeing we're seeing functionality migrate away from hardware and into a software layer that's an actual infrastructure layer. Now that soft, that, that intelligence, it may be in a hypervisor, it may be in an OS kernel, it may be, heck, heck it may be in a load balancer or a web server, but it's a piece of infrastructure that the app uses and that's intelligence in software as an additional layer. So I think it's valid for us to say there will be a software infrastructure layer. It's a software infrastructure layer, it evolves at its own pace, it provides its own services, and the app sits on top of that. And I don't think the app cares about it at all. I think the app it is oblivious. It shouldn't care. It, exactly, it shouldn't care. And so it's, so, so it, it's the responsibility of this infrastructure software layer to, to provide you know, a, a utopian compute surface, a utopian data center surface for the app. It kills DevOps to be called dev. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, I mean if what you're saying is true. It's yeah. just development. Exactly right. I mean, like, like, like. Listen, to me, the utopian future is you've got this intelligent software layer that's providing infrastructure, and the interface to the user is a policy interface. Now, there are always going to be business needs, whether it's security needs, whether it's performance needs, whether it's economic needs, that we have to communicate with that interface. But that's a policy interface. This is policy wonks and business wonks that are talking to this thing. I mean, I always say with Intel processors, the most complex software, but no one ever programs because they have a hardened top on it, so why not create that for infrastructure? Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is where we're going. I mean, this is the, I think this is the biggest movement in IT in the last 10 years, is the movement of functionality from classic hardware into a software infrastructure layer. How far are we off for that utopian? You just peg a year, pick a solar system where we might fly to to see that, or in reality, what? how far along that are we on that <laughs> well, journey? I mean, I think, I think that... I mean, obviously it's great vision. Yeah. No, that's right. That. I mean, I mean Here's what's hard for me for predictions. In 50 years, will the human race still be the same species? Probably, but like, will we have the same no, type of No, I mean, it's this decade, of how close are we? I mean, so, so network virtualization teases out this concept. Exactly. I get that. So, yeah, yeah. so is it five years? Is it 10? Yeah, so, yeah. Order of magnitude. Great. No, no, great question, great question. So I think for generation three data centers, we've already arrived. Right? We've already arrived, we're already here, we can see it, we can look at it, we can understand the benefits. For traditional IT, we're now going up the adoption ramp. I think we're crossing the chasm. I think actually probably, I mean this year's the chasm crossing year, which means we'll be entering a mature market in 2015. Awesome. Uh, on the networking side. And yeah. I think we've got a lot of work to do and we have a heavy tail to deal with afterwards. Yeah, Martin, yep. when I hear about applications and infrastructure, I'm thinking about what Docker's doing out there. I'm yep. wondering, you know, I mean, it's early days. At DockerCon, there was like one page written about networking yeah. earlier this year. Yeah. Uh, how, how do containers and Docker fit into, you know, your vision of the future? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, I'm interested in changing networking. That's what I'm interested in. And to change networking, I need to touch as many points of the network as possible. Whether that's a legacy physical workload, it's a bare metal workload, it's a container, uh, it's a VM, and the, whether that VM is KVM, Zen, or whatever. And so for me, a container is just another endpoint that I want to connect to. 
What's interesting about the container discussion though is um, containers often host Gen 3 apps. And so Gen 3 apps don't require as much features in, in the virtual network because they, they re-implement a lot of it. So one of the core use cases for them is actually security because now we can implement security services in a separate trust domain um, and we can do that fully compatible with things like NSX. So I think that you know, using containers is great and we certainly want to support them with NSX and we will. So give us the update on the news, your news, on the promotion. Apparently there's a promotion recently. Um, is there a new role? I mean, apparently, I mean, first of all, the jack chairs always move uh, yeah. in VMware, but we do like the senior executive roles. You know, got Pat, yep. you got a, the back office uh, CFO here and there, and you got Carl go to market M&A, yeah. uh, and Bill over there. What's your new role? What's your official title and new focus? Yeah, so I've, I've, uh, I'm now the GM of the Network Security Business Unit, so I'm responsible for everything, so. I'm responsible for PL, so I want to say. Welcome to the big leagues, baby. Come I, to your head. I, I find that there's lots of synergies in this organization, and one plus one <laughs> equals three, and we leverage our core competency oh, to come together. Bingo. How did I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're under a lot of pressure. See, revenue generating, what's your run rate you're doing? You said 100 million? 100 million this year. And just, just in, in, uh, in NSX. Great, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. awesome. Well, yeah. Martino, always great to get you. I want to get one final bumper sticker. I know one, you uh, always have something great to add. This year's VM World, put the bumper sticker on the show for the folks out there watching. How would you summarize? Uh, the network virtualization evolution and journey. Where are we, and and and, and the impact to uh, IT? I, I think it's it's <laughs> it's two words. Well, one of them is a contraction. Two words. One of which is a contraction. It's here. Okay, we'll be right back. Live, San Francisco, VMworld 2014, Secure. We'll be right back. Thanks.